that the uh, the shiur is uh, uh, is dedicated in Lui Nishmat, and uh, the Nishma of uh, Mitch's father is from another bracha, Shabbat Aliyah, as well as uh, as I will connect the shiur. Um, those of you who saw the source sheet that went out, so um, connected to uh, Rabbi Sachs's not only to his memory but also uh, to uh, to the, some of his Torah, um, and uh, it should uh, be l'schut uh, nishmato as well. Um, so I'm going to share the screen. Um, so just let me know if, when everybody sees it. You should see it now. Yeah, you can. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So the um, um, okay. So the basically, as it turns out, I mean, uh, you know, it's a uh, today for you know for any of the uh, the the I won't say the North Americans because the Canadians don't really care about it, but in terms of the, uh, the former the expats from uh, the United States, so today is um, Thanksgiving. Um, we're going to touch towards the end of this year, a certain controversy. Um, but what I found to be fascinating how three different gedolim um, of the mid 20th century who lived within a uh, less than a 10 mile radius, one of the other, less than 15 kilometers, one from the other, um, had very different approaches to the way that they looked at particularly Thanksgiving with regard to um, the issue that I'm going to be focusing on today in terms of as you know, normally speaking, I connect the, the question that we uh, deal with to um, the Parshat HaShavua. So I'm not only connecting it because today happens to be Thanksgiving. I guess if I were giving the shear in, uh, uh, in the United States, so then I would uh, connect it to because of Thanksgiving. But the um, I don't the Thanksgiving isn't uh, as big of an issue here. I mean, I know for some of the Americans it really still is, but the um, it happens to be, and I don't know if there if this is, shows a certain hashkacha pratit, but Thanksgiving almost always falls out on Parshat Vayetze, um, and I find that um, very uh, interesting. To um, probably just a coincidence, but still. There's a, it's an interesting coincidence because the the parsha perhaps more than any other parsha, um, and certainly it's the first parsha. I mean, you can uh, quibble and say perhaps the Yosef story um, is also involved with it. But I think that the um, the question of how Yaakov uh, deals with uh, Haran and how Yaakov deals with Lavan, so th it becomes a prototype really of how a Jew as an individual, but also how the Jewish people throughout history have dealt with the question of um, dealing with being a minority um, in a foreign culture. Um, and that is of course at the heart of the halacha that we're going to be discussing later on of uvuchukotehem lo telechu. Um, but before we get into the halachic side of things, I'd like to deal with it more from a philosophical perspective. And here, um, I want to focus on two different um, uh, ideas that come up in the parsha, in the midrashim of the parsha, the parshanim. So at the very beginning, um, you don't have the psukim in front of you, but at the very beginning, when Yaakov arrives in Haran and the first people that he meets, um, Upon the upon arriving, are the shepherds uh, um, at the well waiting for enough people to come in order to um, remove the the rock which is at the the Evan Al Piha Be'er, the the rock which is on the um, sitting on the well, and all of the story in terms of Rachel and Yaakov coming and moving it by himself, etc. Um, when Yaakov addresses those shepherds. So um, he basically says to them, you know, he, not basically, he, he addresses them as achai, my brothers, right? He's, they're, they're total strangers. He's never seen them before in his life. He doesn't even know exactly where he is. He says, may I where are you from? He wants to 
He doesn't know yet that he is in, he knows he's in the general uh, vicinity of Haran, but you know, Waze hasn't gotten him to exactly where he needs it. He hasn't put in the location for the well. And so he, so he asks, where am I? And he addresses them as Achai, my brothers. And the Ramban um, on that Pasuk says the following. Well, he quotes a Midrash in the Psikta that says the following. Yeshomrim, this is the first source. Yeshomrim, she'amar lahem achai derech musar. K'mo she'amar l'roim achai me'ayin atem. In other words, Yaakov, wherever he is, he, could, he talks to them as his brothers. This is actually a little bit later in the parsha, But it's, it's a, a question of simply you you um you are you're a foreigner right Yaakov is um a newcomer to this place and yet derech musar you view yourself as not being apart from the um from the society which you find yourself but rather it's very much appropriate to say achai my brothers right? the Ramban just simply you know brings this as a um clearly a uh, uh, a, a, a strong possibility. And of course, the, the, it, it harks upon the, qu- the basic question of how we should view ourselves. Do, should we be viewing ourselves really as brothers or should we be viewing ourselves as being apart? That's a, okay, just a, uh, perhaps as an opening. But if we continue in the Parsha, um, one of the most dramatic stories in the Parsha is of course the story in which Lavan uh, switches uh, Leah for Rachel, and Yaakov, um, as a result, all of his uh, his best laid plans um, become uh, overturned. Um, and the Midrash has a. I've only taken a bit of the Midrash because the Midrash uh, that deals specifically with the points that I want to talk about. But this is a an incredibly rich midrash dealing with various layers in the story. But the midrash says the following: It's in the Breshit Rabbah, it's number two. Lavan et kol makom vayas mishte. So Lavan gathers everyone together and makes the mishte. And the the, um, the the midrash um, is probably focusing. It doesn't say so explicitly, but I think the midrash is focusing on why the Torah has to tell us the details of the nature of the Mishteh, the fact that Yaakov will have a, that Lavan will say seven days have to transpire before Lavan, before Yaakov can take Rachel as his second wife, etc. No, it's the details of the story. We, we know that the Torah is not always rich in details with regard to the, the events. So every detail becomes a focus for further deliberation. So here we have a, an instance of that. Right? Why do we have to know that it becomes basically a, um, a communal celebration? So the Midrash says the following. He gathered all of the people together. We all know Remember, Yaakov has been working now for seven years for Lavan. We had a water shortage. After all, that's the the idea, the story at the well is indicative that there's just not enough water for everyone, and they have to um, apportion it um, appropriately. The Kevin Shabbat Sadiq Hazelikan. Since this um, Sadiq has come to us, since this Jew, if you will, has come to us. Right, the the Jews have brought us prosperity. Amridon um, lay, What are we going to do? In other words, they are aware that if Yaakov marries Rachel, there's a good chance that he's going to take Rachel and move back to Canaan, the same way that Rivka, his aunt, was taken and brought to uh, Yitzchak. I mean to Yaakov, excuse me, Yaakov's mother. Amar Lahon. So he said to them, In Bayin, if you are willing to, in Bayin Atun, Ana Mirame Bay Vyahivle Leah. So they hatched the plot together. In other words, it's not 
just Lavan's doing. It takes a village to fool a Yaakov, right? To basically it's saying, we're taking a look at the Jew. We want him in our midst. Um, and that the, um, so let's make sure that he stays with us. So we're going to at least extend it another seven years by switching Leah with Rachel. Duhu Rachim Lahada Rachel Sagi. He loves Rachel dearly. Duhu Aved Acha Gabchon Shiva Shanin Achrim. He's going to work another seven years. Amrin Lay Avid Maida Hanilach. So it's not just Lavan's plot, it's the entire community's plot that's in on it. And now the Midrash. Now, excuse me? Yeah. Yeah, why the, isn't Lavan considered a Jew? Why isn't Lavan considered a Jew? Yeah. Because Lavan is he's a member of the family, but he hasn't accepted any of the uh he's not he's not part of the Brit, he's not part of the covenant. Is he, he views is himself, he not he, he, he's the uncle, isn't he? He's an uncle, um, and Abraham has brothers, he has Nachor, but they're not part of the covenant. They haven't been uh, included, incorporated. We see later on. Lavan, in, at the end of the parsha, when he says goodbye um, to, to Yaakov, it's very clear that there is a, a boundary being drawn between, and there's a, uh, a, a treaty being made between Lavan and Yaakov, but not only between Lavan and Yaakov, but between, from Lavan's perspective at least, from the god of Yaakov with the gods of Lavan. In other words, so mm. Lavan is not is is an outsider. Rivka had to leave to become part of the new um, uh, of, the, of this new family with Yitzchak. So now the people of Haran in this uh, story are deeply involved in the subterfuge. Kule Yoma, have a The entire day, in other words, it wasn't just um, a um, a moment. Uh, that that happened, that they switched Leah. The whole day, they keep Yaakov um, basically, um, uh, we'll, we'll say that he is, um, uh, I, oh, my, <laughs> my word, English is, is leaving me this morning. But anyway, the, basically, he's uh, being distracted. The cave on the they, 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 they keep him occupied. Correct. They, keep they, keep him, they want to distract him. They keep him occupied all day long. Kevan de Al Beramsha, when he came at, um, at uh, in the evening, he's he's apparently according to the midrash, he's very surprised. Amar lahon, mahu kedin, right? Why are you doing this? Like what? You know, this should be just a family celebration. Why are you so deeply involved in my wedding? Amridle. They said to him, don't you understand? At gamat chesed bischutech, right? You, we, we're grateful to you. We, we value your contribution to um, our society. And they were dancing in front of him and saying, and this is the Middle East after all, Hali! Hali! Right? This is the same type of call that you might find in, in the Middle Eastern societies to this day. Hali, hali. And but they were saying, he leya, he leya. Right? They were, while they're um, they're basically marching him to the slaughter, they're saying, okay, Yaakov, th this is our party. He leya, he leya, he leya. It is leya, it's leya. Birabsha, so now in the evening, Atun ma'alta v'chafun betzina. So they go upstairs, right? They've, they've had the chuppah, or whatever they've had in terms of the marriage ceremony. And now they go upstairs to the, um, to the honeymoon suite and they extinguish all the candles. Amar lahen mahu keden. So he said, now again, the same mahu keden that he said before. Right before he said, Mahu Kiden, why are you doing this? So here too, he's saying, Mahu Kiden, I don't understand what's going on. Explain this to me. Amrule Ma'at Savur. 
Da'anan dichrin dichvatchan. What do you think? That we are rams, we're animals like you? In other words, here's the same people who a few moments ago told him, at gemalt chesed b'schutech. Right? You gave us all of this wonderful chesed and we are grateful to you. And at the same time, they're underscoring to the Jew that we are more genteel than you are. Of course, we're going to extinguish the lights because, you know, this is a holy moment. This isn't a time to be, um, to have the lights on and having this, um, th this consummation of a marriage viewing it just simply as the coupling of, a, of two animals, right? The mating of two animals. So we have, we have our customs and you, of course, are going to be expected to keep to those customs. Now, by keeping to those customs, of course, that's where the deception is going to come in because that's the moment where, of course, Leah is now switched with Rachel. V'chol ha'hu leila, that entire night, havet tzavich right? This is a, a plaintive moment in the, uh, um, in, the, in the Midrash. The whole night, he was calling out to her, Rachel, v'hi anya and she answered him. B'tzafra, in the morning, v'hinei leya. In the morning, as the Pasuk says, here, it was leya. Now, the lights are back on, and he sees who it really was all night long. So this is the this midrash is an incredible midrash. I mean, the continuation of the midrash is also incredible. Then, then the midrash switches to the um, the discussion or the uh, conversation of Leah and Yaakov. Yaakov accuses Leah at that moment of being party to it and Leah's response, but that's not for me right now, but I, I recommend reading the rest of the Medrash. The, but here, these, these, these few lines, the Medrash is really encapsulating what is the dilemma of the Jew in a foreign uh, culture. On the one hand, he's part of the culture. He is perhaps even valued as part of the culture for the contributions that he makes to the overall society. At the same time, there is a prejudice against the Jew. This idea saying that ma'at savur, what do you think? That we have your primitive rituals. We are a much more advanced society and you're coming into the society. We're welcoming you. We're allowing you to be in our society perhaps, but we're never quite forgetting who you are, and we're also looking down at your values and your expectation. And to top it all off, right? The this very point, the seeming gentility, the seeming um, uh, high culture, is what is going to lay at the heart of the persecution of the Jew. Right? This is all encapsulated in this uh, little vignette as described by the Medrash. And the Medrash is views the launching point for this from the terms of the, the Pshat of the Psukim, because the Torah tells us that Lavan included the community. In words, the Torah is saying, the, we didn't, the, the Medrash is saying, we don't need the community here for the storyline. The only reason the med that the, the community is brought in is to tell me that the community is part of the storyline. That had it not been for the um, Haran community, so the deception and the subterfuge never would have happened. So that is the um, that's the, the 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 midrashic background, if you will, for the question that I want to be focusing on, namely the. Um, the universalism and as opposed to particularism. How do we view our role in a, in a larger world, in a larger society? And here I want to um, basically um, differentiate um, and compare and contrast um, Rabbi Sachs's Zichron Olivracha's um, approach as he laid it out um, most 
fully in um, the uh, in the dignity of difference, um, as opposed to um, Rav Soloveitchik. Um, and perhaps I'll start with Rav Soloveitchik. Um, Rav Soloveitchik um, discusses this in different places, most famously in a in an essay um, which was originally published in Tradition Magazine of the um, Tradition Journal, I should say, um, called uh, Confrontation um, in dealing with the uh, outside world. But in, a, in, uh, in one of the volumes that was of his um, writings that was uh, pu published uh, posthumously, um, Community Covenant and Commitment. So the Rav uh, basically lays it out in the following way. The Jewish religion never maintained that our faith is destined to become universal in order to save mankind from damnation. Our prophets and scholar, scholars have taught that all men who live in accordance with divine moral standards will share in the transcendental summum bonum, which was promised to God-fearing and God-loving people. Summum bonum means the ultimate good at the end of days. However, this tolerant philosophy of transcendental universalism does not exclude the specific awareness of the Jews of the supremacy of their faith over all others. Okay, whereas here, um, the, and that's very uh, imp a very important line. In other words, the Rav is saying that by, by virtue of, and this is a question, of course, when what what do we mean by am skula, right? A chosen people. So there are two basic approaches in Jewish thought. One idea, most famously put forward by um, the Kuzari, and it follows um, in um, uh, the Ramchal, uh, excuse me, the uh, Maharal, the Ramchal, um, perhaps Rav Cook as well, going in this direction. Basically, views the idea of Am Skula is that um, by virtue of the acceptance of the Torah. There is a certain supremacy to the Jewish people, to the Jewish neshama, on a metaphysical level. The other approach, which is a more rationalist approach, doesn't say that amsgula means that uh, we are have any um, inherent um, superiority because of our Kabbalah Torah. It means that we have more responsibility, and that's what's given us this um, uh, this role as the chosen people. And of course, anyone who is interested in joining is welcome to join um, and to become part of that mission. So the mission has not made us a superior people, but has given us a, if you will, a superior mission. That is the, the second way of looking at it. But the, and the rub, by the way, is definitely a proponent of that second idea. The, however, that doesn't mean that the, the religion, the faith, isn't a, to use his term, the supremacy. Hello? Sorry, excuse me. Okay. Um, as a matter of fact, the act of appraising the words of one's particular religious experience. Now he compares this to a, um, because after all, we've just said that other, there is this universal uh, universality. We respect other people's faiths, yet we view ours as being the superior faith. So by saying that, as a matter of fact, the act of appraising the worth of one particular religious experience on the highest axiological level constitutes the very essence of the transcendental performance. So it's basically the rub says that it's impossible for me not to view it that way. In other words, if I am to view other religions as being on par, then there's no reason for me to be a Jew. It's basically a, an either or type of uh, proposition. So for the Muslim, let's say, so then, then he should also feel the same way about his faith that I feel about mine, but he happens to be wrong, right? That's basically the, the idea. In other words, I have a respect for other people's um, faith experiences, but at the same time, my from our, my perspective, from our perspective as Jews, we have to view this as the um, the, the the supreme faith or the, the 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 best possible way to achieve 
some kind of communion with God. The feeling of axiological equality of all faiths as a component of their individual religious experience is a contradicto in objecto. No, it's basically, the Rub says, it's a contradiction in terms. You can't have an axiological equality. That, by definition, is an, uh, a contradiction in terms. Religious tolerance, so then what is religious tolerance, asserts itself in the knowledge of the existence of the variety and plurality of God experiences, that of course we acknowledge, and the recognition that each individual is entitled to evaluate his great unique performance as the most redeeming and uplifting one. In other words, I don't, this is, you know, this is where tolerance comes in. Tolerance doesn't mean that I am, um, I create a relativism between faiths and between ideas. What it means is that I am tolerant, right? I tolerate something, which means that I don't necessarily agree with something. I disagree with these other faith experiences as being the, the best possible way. Maybe some are um, legitimate and some are illegitimate. That might be dependent on perhaps on Shivat Mitzvot B'nai Noach and things along those lines. But I am tolerant of them that they that each of the, the each of the um, members of those faith communities has the right um, to recognize his or her particular faith as being the one which is the most redeeming and uplifting one to use with Soloveitchik's term. So that is how the Rav is dealing with this type of question. Words, how do we view the the Jew as opposed to the surrounding community, the Rav would say we have respect for the surrounding community. We um, share values with the sur surrounding community. And he says all of this in different places. We share values with those communities, but we cannot speak in terms of our faith experiences because by definition, we're on a collision course in, the, in, in those, uh, with regard to those different areas of faith. The, um, Rabbi Sachs had a um, had uh, departed significantly from this uh, way of thinking. Um, uh, Rabbi Sachs, and here I, you know, he ran into some. Um, uh, he read into uh, a lot of criticism for his position, and it forced him to um, come out with the second edition of Dignity of Difference. And you're going to see the, um, uh, you know, t selected quotes here uh, with regard to uh, to his idea. Rabbi Sachs um, felt that uh, this idea of supremacy of our quote, speaking of supremacy. So um, he didn't quite say it was problematic, but he he disagreed with it. So in the in the first edition, he says the following. Um, the um, by the way, I took these quotes. Um, uh, in uh, in tradition uh, magazine back in I think it was in 2011. So uh, Dr. Alan Jotkowitz, he lives in Beersheba. So he um, wrote a, um, a a critique of um, the Rabbi Sachs um, in terms of this a very respectful critique. He uh, he has a, a tremendous admiration for Rabbi Sachs, but um, in, in terms of and the comparison. So if you're interested in a a much fuller discussion of this of this question. So I certainly recommend um, his essay. Um, the um, but here um, the so it's in, it's it, interesting to see the difference between the first edition and the second edition. In the first edition, um, Rabbi Sachs writes the following: In the course of history, God has spoken to mankind in many languages through Judaism to Jews, Christianity to Christians, Islam to um, to Muslim. Only such a God is truly transcendental, greater than not only the natural universe, but also the spiritual universe articulated in any single faith. And I was basically the rub is saying, uh, excuse me, Rabbi Sachs is saying that you are, it is impossible to, if God is beyond all of our, is he transcends um, our, um, our dimension. So he also uh, trans, transcends our spiritual dimensions. We can't possibly, any particular person or any particular group cannot possibly uh, capture all of the, the different facets of the um, experience that would be, that, that, that is expected of mankind to 
um, to to cleave to God. So there are, the, as a result, a um, a multitude of different approaches, um, and they are um, they are seem to be uh, morally equivalent. Um, any specific language of uh, human sensibility. How could a sacred text convey such an idea? It would declare that God of all humanity is God of all humanity, but no single faith is or should be the faith of humanity. I mean, you compare that to what we just saw in Rav Soloveitchik, right? So, you know, that is, of course, um, you know, uh, very much at odds with, uh, with, with what the Rav said. Because the um, it could be, as he said, that the um, that we don't expect every Jew, every person, to accept Judaism, but at the same time, we're saying that there is a supreme faith. Um, so Rabbi Sachs seems to be rejecting that. Um, the now, um, as you can see, in terms of the the flack that he took, it fo it forced um, him to um, rephrase this in the second edition. Right, the same paragraph reads, as Jews, we believe that God has made a covenant with a singular people. So, so he begins by, um, which didn't, this, this idea, which didn't ex it's expressed elsewhere, but still here he begins the discussion by saying that we have this singular covenant, um, but it does not include, exclude the possibility of other people's cultures and faiths finding their own relationship with God within the shared frame of the Noahide laws. And this is a much um, more muted uh, statement than the, the first statement, much more, more, more muted. Um, and here he also throws in, um, which it's, it was perhaps hinted at in the first paragraph. And the first paragraph, he only speaks of the monotheistic faiths. Now we can leave aside for the moment, is Christianity a Vodazara or not? We'll leave that aside, okay? But we'll assume it's, but it's certainly one of the, what we call the monotheistic faiths. It's certainly the, um, considered the, the Judeo-Christian ethic, etc. So he's taking Christianity, he's taking Islam, and he's mentioning those faiths specifically. No, Buddhism isn't mentioned, Shintoism isn't mentioned, right? No mention of, of Hinduism, nothing. Right, so it's basically a, the, um, the faiths that are the monotheistic faith. Here, in the, in the second telling of it, he makes that explicit within the shared frame of the Noahide laws. So it could be that, of course, you need to know that one of the uh, Shivat Mitzvah B'nai Noach is Avodah Zarah. Right? So there, you know, because after all, let's not forget that it's written for the, the broader audience, which is not the, a Jewish audience. Um, and not uh, even necessarily a Christian audience. It's a, for a worldwide um, audience. I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of, uh, of copies have been sold of uh, Dignity of Difference. But, the, um, but still, it's a, you know, for a Jewish reader, we, it, it, uh, we've focused on the covenant, we focused on the Brit, and we have a notion that other people as well have an ability to uh, to 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 find their own uh, relationship with God, as long as they accept Shivat Mitzvah B'nai Noach. Okay, so it's a much more muted way of saying what he had said earlier. These laws constitute, as it were, the depth of the depth grammar of the human experience of the divine. In other words, now he's focusing on what those Shivat Mitzvah B'nai Noach are, the Noahad laws, without expre expressly say, stating what they are, of what it is to see the world as God's work and humanity as God's image. God is the God of all humanity, but between Babel and the end of days. Now, note that he's added that. Well, he's basically, he's again, he's speaking to, to our audience, I think, in this statement, because he's saying that when the end of days, uh, so at that point, at that point, everyone will, should be recognizing the, um, the Jewish experience. But until then, from the time that the world has fragmented, at the time of Bavel, Migdal Bavel, until the world recoalesces into one unit by Yomahu, so then we have this multitude of faiths which have to accept Shabbat Mitzvah B'nai Noach. So it's a, um, but again, it's a, so it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a 
in, in a way, it's a very different type of paragraph than the first paragraph. I don't think that he is backed down, though, from his basic assumption that there is an equivalency, at least in the interim period between now and Yemot HaMashiach, there is an equivalency in the eyes of God of the, of the different faith communities. Now, um, I'll skip the middle paragraph for a moment and go to the, um, to the last paragraph. The truth of the beating heart of the monotheism is that, here's again the first edition, is that God is greater than religion, that he is only partially comprehended by any faith. He's my God, but also your God. He's on my side, but also on your side. And so this is a, uh, a, a, a key phrase. He exists not only in my faith, but also in yours. Now here, to um, in, in the second reading, the truth at the beating heart of monotheism, right? Again, he's, uh, excuse me, he said that in the first time as well, is that God transcends the particularities of culture and the limits of human understanding, right? So he's, the, the idea of him being only partially um, comprehended by any faith has gone, has, is not being stated here, right? It's just that we, um, that it, it transcends because God is beyond anything that uh, of, of human understanding. That's a, you know, pretty power of uh, uh, statement. Now, that's the, that's Rabbi Sachs. Now here in this particular paragraph, he didn't change it. Um, from one version to the other, it's the same. The, but here, now, how, what do you do with this? If you believe that basically all, um, all faiths, right, at least the monotheistic faiths, are legitimate, and they are not only legitimate, because the Rav also said they were legitimate, but that they're, they're equivalent. And it's just a question of you know, whose faith community it is, and each community has its own particular vantage point and own uh, particular mission. So the, um, so then what do you do with this? So then the supreme religious challenge is to see God's image in one who is not our image. That is the converse of tribalism. In other words, basically all religions are now going to view God as being, um, as having a, they have a similar God view, if you will. But it is also something other than universalism. It takes differences seriously. And was the, he's saying that just because I view, to go back to that original statement, um, that God has spoken to mankind in many languages through Judaism to Jews, Christianity to Christians, Islam to Muslims, right? That is a, that, that key line so that still holds true, but, the, but nevertheless, it takes the differences seriously. Because I feel that it's not just simply, okay, um, if I grow up in a uh, certain community, right, um, I don't know, there'll be local foods, right? So um, is there really a difference between um, sushi and gefilte fish? No, there isn't really any difference per se. I, I, I can appreciate sushi more than gefilte fish, and I probably do, right? But the um, but it just happens to be that certain foods evolved in certain cultures for whatever the reason. So there are those cultural foods, but there is no there's no I don't take the difference seriously, right? I can have at my Shabbos table. Um, I can put out the gefilte fish and let's say the appetizer course, and I'll have gefilte fish and I'll have a sushi platter, right? There, there's no difference being taken seriously there, but the religious differences have to be taken seriously. Mm -hmm. It's not simply that different views of God have evolved in different places or in different communities or in different cultures, and now it's all a smorgasbord, but rather the differences mean something. The way that I, that I as a Jew, view God and my mission and my covenant is still very different than the Muslim mission and the Christian mission. And I take those differences seriously. It recognizes the integrity of other cultures, other civilizations, and other paths in the presence of God. But nevertheless, each one of us, each faith community has its own path. And that path is a very important path to be taken. 
So here we have the two very different ways again of the of of looking at it. Two um, and and, um, and uh, Rabbi Sachs was definitely influenced um, as he as he points out um, I mean, both on his own personal trajectory when he describes his meeting with uh, Rav Soloveitchik um, as a twenty year old in nineteen sixty eight as well as um, uh, in his uh, his writings and his uh, thinking that he has clearly been very strongly influenced by the Rav, but at the same time, he parts ways with the Rav. The Rav um, felt that there was a supremacy uh, to, um, to Yahadut. Ultimately, it has to be that way if we're keeping it. And um, Rabbi Sachs is, um, uh, takes uh, issue with that. The, um, there's no question that the Rabbi Sachs's approach is by far from all, from a traditional halachic perspective a much more radical position and a chiddush. Um, uh, it will be it is very difficult to find um, really any uh, strong makorot for what Rabbi Sachs is saying. Um, he's 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 charting a new course. Um, that of course doesn't mean chas v'shalom that it's outside of the pale. Um, and um, but at the same time one should recognize when one's reading it how uh, radical it is in terms of um, uh, the uh, from uh, from a, a traditional Jewish uh, perspective the Rav um, was a modern thinker um, and others you know, who were perhaps less modern thinkers uh, might even take issue with what the Rav said in terms of the legitimacy of other faiths but the um, but at the same time, the rub is much more strongly grounded in um, traditional, what might one call traditional Jewish thought, than Rabbi Sachs's approach. Um, as I said, if you, people if you who are more interested in reading much more about this, um, I really very highly recommend um, Dr. Jotkowitz, Alan Jotkowitz's article um, in, in tradition. If you go into tradition online, um, you'll be able to very quickly find it in their archives. Um, okay. Um, I, I heard someone trying to uh, ask a question. Yes, it, it, Ralph Sussman, if you, if you take the view that, um, that my faith is superior to another um, faith which complies with the Noahide laws, Let's say that you were that Noah. Sorry, sorry, who's speaking? I'm just uh, uh, Stephen Shaw. Stephen Shaw. Okay, because I'm okay. Yeah. Let's say that you were that Noah complying non Jew. Right. Wouldn't wouldn't you be just uh, wouldn't you be justified as that person in saying, well, why why did Hashem create me? What was the point of non Jews in the first place? If if the reality is that my my understanding of Hashem and my, my relationship with Hashem is inherently flawed or, or second class. Well, what was the point of putting non-Jews in, into the world? And if, if, again, if you take that view, why aren't we a proselytizing faith? If we take the view that our faith is superior, surely it's incumbent on us to, to change the world so that people become Jewish and, and go out proselytizing, which, which I don't think we do. Um, I think that the Rav probably would respond. It's really we did at one time. Well, I'm sorry. At the time of Barbara Hamel Yitzhak, we were out gathering in people. Okay, so this is a larger question, and maybe it, uh, I should deal with it in a future shear. Um, the question of should we be a proselytizing faith, and that I think was it was, and maybe um, will become. Um, a machloket again it was during the time of the Tanaim, right? Um, we were clearly proselytizing. Um, at the same time, um, the um, the and, and there and there and you can find um, Tanaim who uh, were in favor of um, of uh, of, pro, of proselytizing, and Tanaim who were very much opposed to it. Um, the um, and I okay, but now is not the time to get into that discussion. So, the um, one could question whether in today's world, 
right? Perhaps we should be proselytizing. Um, you know, where, or uh, I'm not saying, I'm not taking a position, don't get me wrong. I'm just saying, I think the question is a legitimate one. It was not a legitimate question, just from a practical perspective, when we were a um, persecuted minority wherever we found ourselves, because that just um, was, we were not allowed to proselytize for the moment, for the, for the most part, even to the extent that it was a capital uh, crime yeah. for us to do so. So it, um, so that certainly has, um, you know, you don't just um, uh, forget about 1800 years of Jewish experience um, in, in, in a generation or two. Um, but I think it's a legitimate question whether we should be proselytizing. But I think that the Rub would uh, respond um, to specifically to what you're saying, Stephen, is that the, uh, that basically he would say that the if if a person were to come as an individual to me and ask me that question so i would say listen you have um you have one of two ways of going about this either of course you're welcome to join us i'm right? not proselytizing but uh for various reasons which i don't want to get into right now but you as an individual if you find if you want to find the uh the truest possible way in this world of connecting with god so, um, so here's the uh, your path to Geirut. Right? In fact, um, the the Nitziv has a very interesting comment. The Nitziv says the reason what what the, the term Am Skula means. So the Nitziv says in his parish in Hamek Davar that the um, the uh, the term Skula means a jewel. And basically. The, um, the, the Jewish people incorporate the jewels of the entire world. In other words, Geirim are the jewels. And any person who wants to be a jewel and come into our treasure chest, as it were, is welcome to join us. And that's what it means to be an Amskula, to be the, uh, the treasure chest of all of these jewels, those of them that were born into it and those of them who decided to join us. So that's, you know, the, so that path is definitely open. We're not um, an exclusive religion by that, by any means. We are welcoming to the Gare, and we have uh, uh, Pasuk after Pasuk after Pasuk, I think it's 36 times, according to uh, Rabbi Lezer in the Gemara, that Vahaftim et that you should love the Gare, and it's applying primarily to the Gare Tzedek, to the person who joins us. Um, and not to the more general sense of the um, uh, the stranger in our midst. So that's the um, so that's one approach. The other the other side, I would tell them, if you're not willing to join us, you're not interested in joining us, we respect that. But then, right? So you can look at it in one of two ways. You can say, and I think, uh, and perhaps this is historically what happened here, right? In the Roman Empire, so. Um, fully 10%, or excuse me, more than 10%, a, a significant minority of the, of the Roman population before the rise of Christianity were known as God-fearers. They were people who were monotheists, who were looking admiringly at the Jewish people, but saying outside of the Jewish people. It was people who said, we, we buy into the concept, that's Shivat Mitzvat B'nai Noach. But at the same time, 613 mitzvot, that's just too difficult. Right, so that's a so it's a, it's sort of expect, saying that it's the the core concepts are there, and you're recognizing that you are making a compromise if you're not willing to join. But I think the reason why Christianity took off on the basis of those people was that nobody wants to view themselves as second rate. Nobody wants to view themselves as saying I'm making a compromise in my religious experience by not joining the Jewish people, right? By being, let's say, an outside admirer of the Jewish people, but still I'm on the outside. So, and this is what the Rav had said, that if you are a devout Christian, right? So then it, it, then you should be saying that, the, that each individual is entitled to evaluate his great unique performance as the most redeeming and uplifting one. In other words, I can't, um, I can't say to the Christian, 
I mean, I can say to the Christian, I think you're wrong. And you as the Christian can say to me as the Jew, but you're wrong, right? You've missed it. The idea is that we both have to be tolerant of the other to accept the fact that from my vantage point, I am doing this in the most, in, in the best possible way. Um, and I think that you're not. And you, from your perspective, feel the exact same way about me, that I, the Christian, am doing this in the best possible way, and you're not, right? But I'm saying it that this is the best possible way, whichever side of the of the um, of the table I'm on, it is the best possible way. And if you don't believe that, right? Again, now uh, speaking to your hypothetical um, questioner. So if you don't believe that in Christianity that you are indeed having this um, the the uh, the most redeeming and uplifting one to use the rub's words, so then you have to join us. I mean, that's the question. The moment that a person feels that the other faith is indeed the one which is redeeming and uplifting, so then I suppose from a if he's being totally intellectually honest, then he should be then he should switch teams. Not necessarily. Right. That's the idea. Now, the the notion of, well, why then isn't the, the world, why don't we say that the world should all be Jews is perhaps because it's a process. It's a process that takes 4000 years. And that, you know, that's something that uh, actually Rabbi Sachs talks about um, at length elsewhere. It's a process that is, is still ongoing, that the um, the attempt and that's what Bavel proved that Migdal Babel, that is, that the attempt of working with the entire world as one is, a, is, um, is, is destined to failure. And the way to eventually achieve a, a worldwide acceptance of, of God um, is to, and however that will play out in Yemot HaMashiach, is to have a covenant with a specific people. And for that people, and this is, you know, he writes this elsewhere, actually he writes it in Dignity of Difference. The very fact that they are different proves the dignity of difference. That's his, um, that's what he, that's how he would understand it. Okay, but in terms of the, but I, I don't think necessarily that the rub would disagree with the basic idea that in terms of that you can't work, the, the world can't work, or God can't work with the world as a whole. It needs to start the same, also in a similar way, the Jewish people is divided between its Kohanim and with a, a certain Kedusha, as opposed to the rest of Am Yisrael. You require a certain amount of um, a, um, a caste system in order to uplift the whole. Now, that I think is what the Rav would, uh, would respond. Um, okay, so we don't have much time left, actually. We have very little time left. Um, I, this, uh, I was expecting this to be just a, um, an introduction, but we spent most of the time discussing the, the philosophical underpinnings. So now I want to talk about the que a question, um, and I'm not going to be able to do all of the um, Korah um, by any means in the next 20 minutes. But, um, so I, uh, but with that, I'll do our best to cover key issues. The, um, later on in the Torah, in Parshat Vayikra, the Torah, and uh, Sefer Vayikra, uh, it's in uh, uh, Parshat Emor. Lo telchu b'chukot hagoi asher ani mishalech mipnechem ki et kol ela asu v'al katz bahem. So don't the, uh, follow the path of the guy that I'm sending you to, that I'm sending you to them because um, I have, because everything that they have done, actually, this is in, 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 in uh, uh, Kedoshim, that everything they've done is something which is abhorrent to me. And um, I have, um, um, and I have become um, disgusted by them. Now, the, um, this is, um, in terms of this idea of lo telchu b'chukot later on, it, or in, in, in Achremot, we have the, the, the different uh, formulation of v'chukotehem lo telechu, right? Of do not follow in their statutes. So the, um, so here, 
um, the um, there are I'm going to skip the first paragraph, but it's within the context of Okimaasei Eretz Mitzrayim Ucheretz Kenan Lo Taasu. Right? The um, do not follow in the, uh, the 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 actions of Eretz Mitzrayim and uh, Eretz Kenan. So now the Midrash asks the following question. Right? In other words, why does the Torah not tell us what kind of statutes we're talking about? In other words, the Torah does tell us at other places specific instances of of um, practices which God finds repugnant, of sa- of child sacrifice, of um, uh, of magic and sorcery and superstition. So all of these things are mentioned. So what is the Torah saying? So the answer is that you shouldn't, in a much more general sense, not have the um, these um, their nimusot, their their mores. Their, uh, this is the um, the idea. Their customs, the, um, the their practices. General. What are they? Do not go to the theater, kitarot. Do not go to the circuses. Right, the Roman circuses. So that's very different than Barnum and Bailey. But the point is, don't go, don't um, uh, be part of their cultural practices. Now, this is a halacha that requires a, a lot of um, of, uh, of description. But what is the what's what's the range of the of the people that we're talking about? Is it the is it every non-Jew who called Hagoy? The so here there are three different basic approaches but one which becomes very clearly the dominant approach. The first approach is the Sefer Yireim, who was a, um, um, an Ashkenazic, um, actually, excuse me, a French um, uh, commenter, commentator in the um, and uh, halakhic authority uh, of the Balei Tosfot. Um, he says the following, um, that it is specifically regarding the nations of Canaan at that time. We have Kemase Eretz. Um, we have the the people of the of Eretz Canaan, and also Maase Eretz Mitzrayim. It's only those peoples that that uh, the Torah is referring to, um, and there the um, and he says the Chasher Yisira Katuva Maase Shivatu Mal Bechukotehem Kach Yisira Maase Mitzrayim Bechukotehem. Right, that the uh, you're coming to this. Um, to Eretz Canaan. You're supposed to eradicate Canaani culture. You're supposed to eradicate um, the, the, the practices of Canaan. By extension, you also should be turning your back on the practices of Mitzrayim because these are corrupt cultures, specifically. And so everything about them, rather even things that seem to be neutral, are things that the Jew has to reject. But it's very limited in terms of the scope. Right? It's only specifically those nations at that time. That is the, uh, the way that the Sefer Yireim understands it. The Sefer Achinuch um, broadens it to a certain extent. He says explicitly, This applies to all nations. However, why? Because they veer away from God. And they worship Avodah Zarah, which would mean that if you're dealing with a monotheistic uh, culture, let's say just for, um, uh, you know, for argument's sake, um, Islam and perhaps Christianity. So then you don't have the same kind of um, the same kind of isur to to follow their customs. The um, the Rambam, and perhaps this is 
it's hard to say because the Rambam, they're all basing themselves on the, uh, the, the writings of Chazal. But Chazal, when they're talking, certainly from the, uh, um, the Sefer Achinuch's perspective, all of the peoples that, the, that Chazal were speaking about were all pagans. So there was no um, competing monotheistic culture that we could be talking about. It was the Romans. The, that was their theaters and their circuses. But the, of course, those are also dedicated to the Roman pantheon. So the um, so the it was a real culture comp between Judaism and uh, paganism, but the um, what would the uh, what would Chazal have said um, a few hundred la years later when the competing cultures are monotheistic? So that's perhaps an open question. The Rambam though takes this as applying even to seemingly to monotheistic cultures. He says. What, and he gives a different reason. The reason that the um, that the Sefer Achinuch had said was because they are God, they are pagans. The reason that the Rambam gives for it's akol bi'inyan echad who must hear shelo yidmelahen eliyeh Yisrael muvdal mehen viyadua b'malbusho uvishar maasav k'moshu who muvdal mehen b'modav uvideotav. But it's basically the Rambam says we should be. This is a, a sur saying to us that we have to be proud of our um, our differences, and we should be taking um, uh, then. And as a result, our dress should be different. Our uh, customs should be different. We should be able to be um, spotted separately, and therefore. He gives, and this is based on the, um, again, based on the uh, the Gemarot and the Mamere Chazal on the, on the idea. And um, I, as the Pasuk says, I separated you from the nations, so then you have to look different. Right. Basically, these ideas are that you should look different, right? And uh, these are descriptions of Roman dress and uh, and Roman hairstyles. So don't dress like the Roman. When in Rome, right? Do not be a Roman. When in Rome, be a Jew. That's the idea of this particular pasuk. And the Rambam, though, does not differentiate in this with regard to um, whether whoever the culture is. The idea is to be separate from that culture. Now, I asked this actually, it was interesting. I, um, I didn't get any response. I, in, in several um, groups that I'm in, I, I asked any people, I'm not familiar with Rabbi Sachs's having spoken about this question of Chukot HaGoyim. How does he deal with this? In fact, in terms of the halacha, I'll just uh, show you a, a, an example, which again, I would uh, have a little more time to do it in uh, greater length, that the, um, the, uh, the, 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 um, the, the practice, excuse me, that, uh, that we're dealing with, um, as, well, we'll just stick to the Rambam. Um, how would you uh, deal with this um, as such? So, interestingly, I'm not. I have. I did some digging myself, and I asked other people. I don't know. I, Rabbi Sachs, to the best of my knowledge, never addressed this um, this question of how to understand this halacha. On the other hand, I could argue certainly that the um, the idea of, if you will, the dignity of difference is not, as Rabbi Sachs himself said. Um, saying that you accept the other side, it, uh, it takes the difference seriously, right? To go back to that line. Words, I, that the idea of, of, um, of recognizing that there is a moral equivalent isn't necessarily the same as being willing to accept a, um, to adopt um, even um, customs of the, um, of, of the other. Now, I, my guess is Rabbi Sachs, it's all a guess, all supposition, because as I said, to the best of my knowledge, he never addressed it, would be much more comfortable with the Sefer HaChinuch and saying that this is restricted to um, 
Obdei Avodah Zarah, it's restricted to the pagan, it's not restricted to um, other monotheistic faith uh, communities. But even if it were, perhaps he would say that it's uh, not a problem. Now, the, um, this, of course, leads to just getting back to the, the halachic discussion. Um, why am I dressed the way that I am right now? Well, it's um, all the clothing that I'm wearing, with the possible exception of my kippah, my tzitzit, which I don't wear out even, um, are, you know, are, are, are as Western culture person. And uh, if I were to be walking uh, on the street, um, I don't look particularly Jewish per se, and uh, if I remove my kippah, certainly if I were to shave my beard, right? So why is, um, is that permissible um, halachically? So the, um, the, this becomes a machloket actually amongst the um, Rishonim, but especially amongst the Akronim. In other words, when Jews were in those communities where Jews weren't forced to dress differently, right? In, in, uh, in places in the world, where Jews were expected to dress differently was a moot point. But when it was a question of Jews um, having the ability to dress um, as the outside world, so what uh, would you do? So here, the, um, the um, a very important piece of Yosef Kalon, the Maharik, um, a Italian um, Acheron in the uh, 15th uh, century. So he, um, has a, um, um, a piece, um, he's very influential in, ma in many uh, uh, contexts, um, especially in Ashkenazic Psak. So he um, says the following, um, that the, um, that uh, he adds a very important idea here that the, and it's not necessarily so totally clear, but he basically says that the Isur of Vuchukotehem lo Telechu is dealing with specifically a Davar Mishune, right? That's the, the key word here that it is a, an odd custom that doesn't have, seem to have any uh, rhyme or reason. Now he'll also add um, the, a, things that will lead to Isurim are certainly forbidden. But even if you have something which won't necessarily lead to an Isur, but it's just a, a, um, it's a, a type of a custom, their hairstyle. It, like why should you be, um, you know, shaving your, um, uh, wearing a you know a Roman type of hairstyle, so it's it's because you don't want to be like the Jews, so that is a uh, a problem. But he says, and the particular case that he's talking about was wearing the the cap and gown, right? What we view as graduation garb, so um, developed in the Middle Ages as being the the actual garb of um, of professionals. So the question that he was dealing with was a would it be permissible for a physician to wear the the cap and gown which was the um, the, the garments that were worn by uh, by doctors at that time? So if you're wearing those kind of, kind of red dress, you're wearing it's a chukotagoi. You're not a better uh, doctor by virtue of the fact that you're wearing a um, a, a, a scarlet uh, robe. Um, along those lines. So um, should it be permissible? Is it chukot goyim today for, I don't know, doctors to wear scrubs, right? After all, it wasn't a Jewish practice that decided that. So he says, if it's something which has a purpose to it, and in this case to show um, in a community who the doctor is, so then of course it's permissible. It's only a problem if there is, if it's basically nonsensical and you're just doing it for that sake. Based on this, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the consensus has become, though there is a significant, uh, I don't have time to get into it now, unfortunately, the Ramah, the Gra is the, um, is, the, uh, 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 is the dissenter here. But the Ramah following this says that a davar shenagul to'elet, kegon shedarkan shal kol mishu rofei mumche yesh lo malbush miyuchad shnikar bo shu rofei uman, mutar lo lovsha. So anything which is 
וכן שעושים משום כבוד אותם אחר, מותר. It's not just that you could say, well, there's, is there a professional reason for doing it, even if it's for kavod, in other words, human dignity is also an important reason. So if you're, if you're, if you're wearing something because, it's, uh, if that, because this is the, if you will, the, the, the higher class in society wears it, so then that's significant and that's, per, that's permissible as well. So that is the, um, that's the idea that the, um, uh, that the Ramah says. The Gra disagrees and the Gra feels that, um, in, that unless there is a, um, that unless it's a, a, a garment that Jews would be wearing anyway, it's forbidden. Um, based on this, by the way, just in terms of the Psaq um that Rav Moshe in the Tshuva, where he was asked with regard to wearing um, uh, specific we wearing Western clothing, so he makes the following observation: that the what makes something non-Jewish. Now, um, if all Jews, you know, basically, if, um, if there's a cultural type of war, or, or not even war, but there's a difference. So, if you go back to the medieval period. Christians wore one type of clothing. Jews wore another type of clothing. So now, if I even if the Christians say you can wear this Christian garb, but it's still Christian garb. Today, it's Western garb. It doesn't the the people who are and forgetting about who's in the shmata business, but who is you know it's not being sold specifically for non-Jews and saying Jews can also wear it. It's being sold for all the citizens of the world. So then, then it doesn't become non-Jewish anymore. It's just clothing. Right? It's an, in, an interesting observation that um, Rav Moshe makes. Um, the question which I unfortunately have run out of time to deal with, which, um, which I wanted to discuss, is the question of um, the celebration of Thanksgiving. Is that a problem to recognize a holiday which does not have necessarily um, strong Christian roots? It's not like saying, well, today we've drained um, New Year's and even to a certain extent Christmas has been drained of religious significance. And so now can, uh, can Jews celebrate a national holiday on the 25th of December. But here, when it comes to the, um, uh, without getting into the history of Thanksgiving, when it comes to the fourth Thursday in November, so basically it was a, um, a government uh, edict by, uh, by Abraham Lincoln in the 1860s that got that um, rolling. Um, it had, religious uh, significance. When they talked about Thanksgiving, they were talking about thanking uh, uh, Christian God. But in terms of the overall celebration, it has, it's a much more secular type of holiday and much more general concept. Is there anything wrong with the Jew taking the day off, a Jew um, using this as uh, eating turkey, um, having a Thanksgiving dinner? Um, so the uh, I don't have time to unfortunately read the Makarot. I'm just going to just say that here, if you take a look at the um, numbers, uh, uh, the uh, 17 through uh, 20 um, on, on the sheet, um, basically you see three different approaches. Um, the most radical approach on one hand is the Pachad Yitzchak, that was Rav Hutner. Rav Hutner felt that it was not only a problem of Chukotehem for a Jew to celebrate Thanksgiving, but it was also perhaps bordering on Avodah Zarah um, for, for different reasons. Basically saying you're taking a, a holiday which has Christian roots, even though it wasn't a Christian celebration, a Christian observance, but still has Christian roots, and you're turning it into something which is Jewish and adopting it for yourself on a, on a yearly basis. So that is definitely the Chukotahem and very well might be a, um, uh, might be a problem of Avodah Zarah as well. On the other extreme was Rav Soloveitchik. Uh, he didn't write about it, but it was known that he would finish his shear early on Thursdays uh, on, on Thanksgiving Day in NYU in order to catch the flight back to Boston um, and to be able to uh, celebrate uh, Thanksgiving dinner with his, um, with his family. Um, the, um, and this is the 
um, uh, and as, as reported by Rav Shechter in Nefesh HaRav, he says that the Rav um, would said that it was permissible to eat that Rabbeinu Aitashim Utar Lechol Basar Hodu Besof November beyond Thanksgiving, right? So that you could um, celebrate Thanksgiving, and the the um, and, but but he never said exp- apparently explicitly in Shir. It's only Havanu Lishila Daato. We understood from his position that it wasn't Chukot Tagoyim. So presumably the reason is because along the lines of the of clothing today, um, that if you have a celebration, which is a universal celebration and doesn't have any particularism de- uh, in the celebration itself, right, and it's themes that Jews can appreciate, after all, how can you not talk about Chag Hodaya? How can you not talk about that? So then if a Jew wants to participate in that, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, that was the, the rub. Um, as I said, he lived just a few miles away from um, Rav Huttner, and they were in contact with each other, but they had very different uh, approaches to this uh, question. Um, in the middle was Rav Moshe, Rav Moshe Feinstein, both in the middle in terms of the position as well as geographically uh, between Brooklyn um, and, uh, uh, the, um, and Washington Heights, um, but on the Lower East Side in Manhattan. But he basically said that the, um, on the one hand, he was, um, uh, he has three or four true votes, which seem in some ways to contradict one another. But the bottom line lines is that the, um, he says that on the one hand to establish it as a holiday um, would be a problem of hukotehem lo telechu. If, if I were to say, Every year, I'm going to religiously celebrate Thanksgiving. That would be a problem. But, um, however, if you just say that lo lechovah lemitzvah ela lesimcha tarishut, if you're just simply saying I'm recognizing the holiday and I'm eating my turkey, etc., that is not usher. As long as you're not saying it is something which is a a, 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 a ritual which should be. Uh, kept. I'll just mention that um, in this context, and I apologize for going over time, but just that the um, my um, I, I I I was most influenced um, not by the Pachad Yitzchak and not by uh, the Rav and not by Rav Moshe, but by my mother Zichron Ali My mother, my own my mother would uh, said the following: she, We always had a thing. We always had our, our turkey. Our Thanksgiving turkey, but she would only serve it on Friday night. She said that uh, as a matter of principle, I can't have a nicer meal on Thursday night than I have on Friday night. So our Thanksgiving dinner was always on the Friday of uh, the Shabbos of Thanksgiving, um, and um, that that message of uh, of understanding the uh, what Jewish values are as well as what is uh, what Shabbat is. So for me personally, that uh, has uh, very much uh, influenced uh, me. But in terms Robert, of, uh, yeah. Rabbi Sussman? Yeah. I think that your mother must have some Hasidic roots of the option there where they can move, they can move events to a different time in the week. <laughs> that could be. No, my mother was very know, talented. She was, a, she was very, she was multi-talented. So it, does, it wouldn't surprise me at all. But the um, but in any event, the uh, the question I think of uh, getting back to um, the beginning of the shear, in terms of um, of understanding, really goes to the heart of uh, on a on a more uh, if you will philosophical level of trying to juggle a very uh, critical question of how we view ourselves in the in the larger world, both in terms of the um, in terms of our particularism. Um, the our being citizens of the world as a whole and our um, acceptance tolerance um, and views of the um, of, of different cultures um, and it's something which uh, is uh, not a simple halachic question yes no etc but really is a very deep um, religious philosophical issue which um, continues to develop and evolve um, to this very day so um, uh, wonderful uh, to see you all again. Um, 
fast okay. question. My, my mother also uh, celebrated on Friday, so okay. not the only mother. It's a good Jewish minhag. Fast question. Uh, yeah. when, when was that medrash that we started with written? That medrash is, medrash Raba of Bereshit is, um, uh, um, is attributed to the, uh, if I'm not mistaken, to the sixth century. It's a Eretz Yisrael Midrash. Um, so it's a, a collection, Medrash Rabbah is a collection. It's an um, uh, anthology of Midrashim. Um, so it includes earlier material as well. But it's, um, it was edited in, um, in the, I think, in the, the fifth or the sixth century um, here in Eretz Yisrael, Gracious Rabbah. My, my question really was the influence of circumstances that it was written under uh, stress certain points, very valuable points of a condition of a particular time. Okay. Um, the, um, uh, it, it is a, um, it, it, it certainly, uh, let's put it this way. It certainly, I think uh, uh, it reflects what was going on in, uh, um, in Byzantine uh, Eretz Yisrael. Um, that's a time of uh, a great deal of persecution. Um, it's also the rise, at that time, it's the rise of Christianity. Um, and uh, not the rise, Christianity has become the official religion of the, of the Roman Empire um, in the fourth century um, with Justinian. And that's when you have uh, very severe persecutions of Jews beginning for the first time. Um, at the same time, I just don't know necessarily if that particular medrash is um, is if it was was authored, if you will, in under uh, under Christian rule, or it's an earlier medrash from pagan Roman times, um, and that it's incorporated into the medrash. So I can't say whether it's you know the the Jew under Christian uh, rule or the Jew under pagan rule, but it's certainly the Jew under Roman rule. Um, writing it and having that uh, that that tension on the one hand the um, the uh, I, let's let's just say step step back one step further the, there is certainly a uh, denigration of Jewish practices in the Roman Empire pre Christian Christianity um, that that Jewish practices are considered to be somewhat barbaric and primitive. Right. Um, even in something you know, uh, along the lines of Shabbat, I'm not even talking about something like Brit Milah, but does, but but uh, but certainly something like Brit Milah. But even in something like Shabbat, um, it's a uh, um, the, there's a uh, a real conflict in terms of whether there's a value in taking a day off from work, or that that just shows laziness that you're not working uh, 24/7. All right, so that's a uh, that's a uh, you know that's a, a, an argument that goes on between Roman thinkers and Jewish thinkers. I mean, not in an argument the way that we think of arguments, but when you read right. their different writings. So um, so that basic idea is is definitely there. So that area, we've gone really uh, well over time, and I know Rabbi Leaptag is going to be starting in a few minutes. Uh, it was wonderful seeing you all again, and uh, till the next time. Thank so, you very uh, much. Call to. Bye-bye.